Hello, hello, and welcome to Creation Watch. Thank you so much for sticking around live from the Hive audience, and welcome, welcome to those folks watching this on Creation Watch Wednesday. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we got a, a different sort of angle that we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be hitting things at today. So stick with me, and you will see what I'm talking about here. Uh, so. When it comes to uh, evolution, the idea of descent with modification in a, in a species or clade or crime, if you know what those things mean, uh, that's just different ways of grouping animals. The most important terminology that I want you to remember when we talk about uh, classifying animals is clade. All that clade means, use that term, is that this group of animals all shares a common ancestor, uh, and they're, they're with with uh, no except exceptions being added and no inclusions being removed. It's a that's a clade. A clade means that you all can trace your ancestor your ancestry back to a specific single population. Okay, so and remember, you guys another thing to remember that when we talk about evolution, it's not about individual change, but but uh, uh, genetic features that take hold in population. So this is all going to be population based not um, individual uh, organism base, which is a lot of the problems that people run into when they talk about about evolution in general, is that they don't they have a hard time thinking about it in the context of populations and want to think about it in context of uh, each individual organism's genomic traits. and that ju that's just not how it works. and it's not a, not a way to, that we can we can track population dynamics that way. So that's the first misunderstanding. I think that people like, um, like Kent Hovind really cemented that in place, but it's not unique. This idea of, of denial of evolution is not unique in any way to, uh, to Christianity or a uh, Baptist or any of these, these, uh, groups. They're actually, these, uh, ideas are pretty common among a few different, uh, different sects of religion, but all, most all of the Abrahamic, uh, faiths will have a sector that, that, that believe that evolution is a farce. And that's what we're going to look at today. And these folks um, are actually uh, Muslim. Uh, you know, this is a, a Dawah channel. They have, it's called Nas, Nasiha Sessions. They have 229,000 subscribers. That's a big channel. Uh, and their production uh, quality is quite high, actually. They do videos on topical stuff and religious stuff. They're, you know, Pakistan, Egypt, just basic how to learn about Allah kind of stuff. This guy is like the main host here. And we're going to, uh, you're going to see a lot of him. There's things like here, Andrew Tate, uh, who is a Muslim in his arrest. They have, uh, yeah, very topical stuff, a, a very modern channel. So it's not like I'm about digging in the, the back catalogs for this, but what I was uh, looking into this topic, because I wanted to know what the, what the Quran said about evolution, I, I found this video and it brought me to this channel. So this is that video. It's called Why Don't Muslims Believe in Evolution? And it's, yeah. So we're going to, we're going to see, let me make sure that you all will be able to hear this too. And do I want to do, what do I want to do? There we go. Okay. Here we are. Let's, uh, let's find out why Muslims don't believe in evolution. Might pump boost it back up if we need it. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu brother oh, I'm oh, smiling that's uh some kind of prayer or chant I don't know is it, is it fine you know carry on no we carry on he keeps we have, we've started about four times now he keeps saying to me you're not smiling so when I smile I'm sharp. welcome to another Nasiya session today's episode can I ask something about uh and I'm not trying to like disparage anybody for their fashion choices is it standard for Muslim men to like try to fluff their beard out to be as big as possible. Um, 
I, you know, it is, it's a personal choice. Um, yeah, bug bot, dang it, I forgot to get my water bottle. You're out there telling me to hydrate. Um, I have one over there from last night. Maybe, hold on. One hour later. I did, but it was empty. <laughs> All right. So, do they just fluff out their beards like that? That's my question. But I don't know if it's a cultural thing. The biggest beard is a status symbol. So, it okay. is going to be responding to an email from an atheist, right? An email uh, from an atheist. So, the question, well, the main question, or one of the questions in the email was, why does Islam not believe in evolution when there is clearly evidence for it? Now, I'm sure most, if not all people watching this, will have some sort of idea, some sort of basis of what evolution is. Uh, for those of you who... Except for you two. I bet you two don't have any clue what evolution is. Don't, or you want to me to refresh your memory because it's been, you know, since school days that you lasted science. Um, I'll give you a pretty simple, hopefully practical way that you can remember it, give an example, uh, which might make it... Who wants to bet that their example is Lamarckian? <laughs> Lamarckian evolution. Let's, let's see what they say. Easier for you to understand the concept. So the type of, the type of evolution that I'm going to explain, uh, I believe it's called natural selection, right? And this is where, for example, you know giraffes that we have these days? They have very, very long... All right, hold on. Just real quick before they give their botched version of it. Natural selection literally just means that the animals or plants in nature select their breeding partner the selection process can be random it can be like ex an explosion of gametes into the wind right it can be that it can also be very selective like uh, you see more selection um in uh terrestrial mammal or terrestrial animals uh mostly because you, when we're in the water uh it's just fine to to blast your seed into the to the tides and let nature take its course but on air, if you when you when you blast your seed, it can only be carried so far by the wind, and it has to have certain characteristics, right? So, we invented <laughs> sexual reproduction just in order to counter that, and you can be very specific on what uh, traits you're looking for in your partner, right? That you go, you're not just blasting into the wind and hoping it meets uh, a viable, good reproductive. Uh, partner you're actually very selected that's what natural selection is and it's, yeah, it runs the gamut from being a blast into the wind to a uh, very selective uh, and highly organized mating routines and I have a video or had a video on what day is that dang it I need to just have the stuff pulled up I need to have my schedule pulled up at least maybe give Bugbot my schedule because Bugbot uh Bugbot's pretty good at uh, alerting me about things, so that's one thing I do depend on. Um, let's see. Have I even scheduled it yet? Um, 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 um. I say um a lot if you're new here. You're just going to have to roll with it. <laughs> uh, that was funny doing uh, racist cartoons. I can't wait next Monday's uh Creation Watch, I'm going to be doing the, it's the video, the one where I did the review of the Mormon cartoon and the, yeah, I don't even got this one scheduled yet. There's a, I do have an animal mating ritual video coming up though. I just, I haven't even scheduled it yet. I got a lot of stuff in the back burner, which is good. I like having stuff to keep me busy because working on this channel is my passion. Um, but birds have very elaborate selection processes for instance so there's a there's a gamut of what is uh what is the uh the process of natural selection now there's factors that come into play that are environmental factors that can either uh be a benefit or a boon to your uh to your reproductive strategy success rate right how you select your partners how you uh, or how you spray your seed or whatever whichever process you're using there are uh, upsides and downsides that are environmental impacts uh there are uh other organisms to think about there are also climatic events that uh that you have no control over so and these things can ebb and sway the process by which you pass on and what actually ends up getting passed on that is natural selection at its core Next, right? Uh, back in the days, their ancestors, their necks weren't that long. You know, they used to be relatively short compared to how long they are now. So they look more like horses? 
I guess. I no. I guess you could no, 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 no. Okay, so here's that. another another uh, fun fact for you. Uh, giraffes are more allied with. Uh, uh, so when you think of hooved animals, let's let's break it right in half. It breaks in one half. You got artiodactyl, and one half you got perseodactyl. Artiodactyls are um, your cattle and uh, and cervids. The they some they're sometimes called the even toed ungulates, uh, horses, cattle, antelopes, that sort of uh, of organism. You the we pigs also uh, anything goats, sheep. All of these 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 groups are are artiodactyl. Most of our livestock is artiodactyl, except for horses, and horses are in a, the perseodactyl group with rhinos and tapirs. All right, so horses, rhinos, and tapirs are all related to each other closely and uh, have uh, a, a common ancestor. They are a clade. And then the artiodactyls are a clade, which is cattle, deer, the ones I just named, uh, suids, which are pigs. The giraffes belong in the artiodactyl, and they are closely allied with the cattle clade, but they're closest relatives well dress first drafts closest relatives are the um are the okapi now these this clay giraffids they didn't just fill the, this large browser niche that the okapi and the uh the draft today's draft do they filled lots of niche uh and there were one there were other large browsers uh that were some of the the biggest the biggest artiodactyl in history i think was a um was a giraffe. It, it had like moose looking antlers, really cool looking thing. But there's another group that's in this that shows what, how, what they can look like before or what their, what their non high browsing ancestors, the pronghorn in North America looks exactly like antelope that fill the, the niche in Africa and Asia, except for it's not, it's not an antelope at all. Even though they call it an antelope, it's not an antelope. It's a, uh, it's a, close relative of the giraffids and that is what they would look like what their common ancestors thought to have looked like so not like a horse so a giraffe basically is a horse with a long neck no well, crudely i guess you could okay, say that yeah. maybe 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 not even crudely uh because the ancestors of giraffes were more antelope like and not horse like um and basically obviously as they were eating they were munching grass food trees like a cross between cat like they, they're in between cattle and uh and antelopes and that and that well, I guess antelope are technically in the cattle group but anyway these yeah. leaves whatnot fruits as time progresses food gets scarcer and scarcer and scarcer until it gets to a point where they've eaten all the food on the ground they've eaten all the food that's low on the trees now there's food which is high on the trees yeah now obviously within any species you have you know genetic mutations you have differences between species heights even in humans some people are six foot tall some people are five foot tall some people mm. are more than that some people are less than that you have these you know these variations within the species itself so variations within the species itself so obviously there were some giraffes which had longer necks and there were some giraffes which had shorter necks so the ones who had longer necks were at an advantage because they, i thought like this is a science lesson bro because they could reach the food that was higher up the trees and therefore they had more chance of survival and therefore their genes of having longer necks were more likely to be passed down and become dominant as the species progressed over time so the, long, the ones with the longer necks were surviving so their longer neck genes were being passed, passed on off. Oh, good. They're not. They're not going um, full Lamarckian. Yeah, I just. I, I kind of listened to this while I was editing to make sure it was going to cover the topic that I wanted to talk about. So it did, but uh, at least they're not going Lamarck. Well, and and then, over a very long period of time, over millenniums, centuries, whatever have so you. So there's more long neck giraffes. I will show you a picture of that after we're done. Don't let me forget, Jason, and I will pull up a picture of. Oh, what's the. Uh, Sivatherium. Sivatherium. Check it out. I will pull up Sivatherium after we're done so you guys can get a good look at this <clears throat> this amazing animal. So they, so they mated. They had long neck kids who mated and even, even longer neck kids and eventually got to a point where you have the giraffes you see today. 
And uh, Nasir, if you could edit some sort of giraffe, like I know you can do, you can mash up with the green screen and that. Have a giraffe just walk past, just show people. If you can make the giraffe eat the mic, that'll be sick. That's a bit too much. I don't think I'm you can saying do that. if you could, I'm putting a skill. That's a challenge. If you can, that's do that, not too much. You can do that. If not, guys, just ignore us. I will do that in post. Okay, guys, I will have a giraffe come and eat the mic for these gentlemen. It's not something that's going to be hard to do. Just, just move on. Right. Oh, it's maybe good. It's that. Good. Yeah. Because the question asks, why don't we believe in in evolution, right? Uh, as Muslim, but what you've just explained there, actually, there's nothing in the Quran or the prophetic Sunnah that that prevents us from believing in the kind of evolution that you just described, right? So this, so, atheist, so this atheist has made an assumption. Well, he's not wrong entirely. An assumption? Oh, really? Now, he's wrong in his assumption because there are parts of evolution that are in direct conflict and opposition with our creed. Without see, that's the thing. They're gonna go. I know they go microevolution, macroevolution, which uh, the only the, just macroevolution means that the microevolution is compounded enough to uh, to cause a speciation event, which is the the uh, that the isolated population can no longer reproduce with the parent population. Very simple stuff. That's our aqidah, right? Um, and uh, we've actually got more reason to believe in our aqidah, and uh, other, we've got more reason to believe in our aqidah. And to disbelieve in the th scientific theories with regards to this, but just to kind of so take just to ask, what do you mean by aqidah? So aqidah means creed, our, our creed, our Islamic creed, right? So just to kind of make the, the conversation, you know, kind of just move forward a step, we've got to divide evolution, evolution into two categories. Okay, here we go. There's macro evolution, and then is micro evolution, and what you just explained. Yeah, there is, but it's only to the extent that it describes the category before and after a speciation event. It's not, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Is microevolution. Okay. It's the small, you know, change in, in a very, you know, kind of dumbed down, crude mm -hmm. kind of way. It's the small changes of, that happen within a particular species over a very long period of time. Well, let's say let's not say within a species, but say within a population, because some of the some of the this may be the part of the problem why this leads to the why are there still monkeys argument. So within the population, not within the species, the species can re uh, there can be another population of the same species that is not experiencing these changes it's um changes within a population of a species that cause them to adapt towards their particular environment that allows for you know their you know survival to kind of take place do you see where i'm from that's micro evolution that's it's, it's happening on a micro level within a particular species macro mm -hmm. evolution is when you're basically saying that you're with uh, that was a good a good explanation there with when you said within the species that's a better way to say it than than just like the uh, microevolution is taking place uh, in the species like the species is just changing on its own now species will change on their own due to you know whatever environmental pressures within the population but evolution of a new species takes place in that population when a group of that species gets isolated and uh, their genetic uh, information is cut off completely from getting input from the parent population and they breed in isolation and, and the uh, unique mutations and changes take place within that group. That is a speciation event from microevolution to macroevolution and it's been observed um, in like the lab, right? It's It's been observed on... on uh, multiple different different organisms. You know, uh, you had you know all human species that came from a common ancestor, uh, and that like common ancestor was you know the chimpanzees, kind of thing, whatever. I'm not a scientist, and I don't need to be a scientist to, to to explain this. But we all get the point, right? That we all have a common ancestor with some primate thing. So they say that there was you know Homo erectus, and then they became, you know, there was all these hominids uh -huh. before the Homo hominids. sapien. There was yep. the Homo erectus, which is a completely different... And it's not Homo sapien, it's Homo sapiens. There's that S on the end. The autocorrect did that, but he said it that way too. Different species, and that Homo erectus evolved into the Homo sapien, and so on and so forth. Is that where the word homosexual comes from? Yes, it actually is. It means man loves man, homosexual, or man who wants to have sex with men. Homo is 
man, it's it's the group, it's the root word uh, that, that we use to describe our genus. So yeah, it means man and Homo neanderthalensis, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. They were all, all men. I don't know where the word homosexual comes from. I don't know. Uh, but I think homo means that man, that kind of thing. Eh? Yeah. So you had these hominids, do you see what I'm saying? Now that's what we have a problem with, Islamically. We have a problem. It's in that, that word too, hominid. H-O-M. Yeah, you see that in the beginning of something? It's usually a man. Not always though, because you look at homo theorem, for instance. <laughs> Homotherium, the man beast. That Allah, he created the first mm. homo sapien, who is Adam. So we as Muslims don't have a problem. Homo sapiens. With literally like all of this other evolution. We don't have a problem with... Within all, animals. Within these animals, within the trees, within all of these other organisms, right? Unless an external evidence comes to say, no, this particular thing, no, no, this didn't evolve, right? So Islam hasn't negated it. Hasn't, hasn't negated it. It hasn't affirmed but, it. But the only thing that Islam has negated is to believe that the human species was evolved on a macro level. Within a micro level, no problem, because some people say on a micro level. Except for that we have like the bones of pretty much every species leading up to Homo sapiens. We do. We have from uh, from our last comedy ancestors with uh, with chimpanzees and bonobos uh or bonobos and we have that from there uh two uh modern modern human well, that if you look in russia for example i don't know how true this is because you know and i'm gonna explain in a second but this is what we were taught in school that in russia because it's colder the people have more hair they're more hairy they have more hairy chest um but then if you go into like africa well no it's it's what they're talking about here is phenotypes, right? Phenotypes, which are the uh, genetic characteristics, the external characteristics that are visible that took place in a population while it was isolated. Those mutations I talked about earlier, how when a population becomes isolated from the rest of the group, when humans left Africa, for instance, the mutations that took place among those groups are what, uh, what we call phenotypic traits. And that's what they're talking about with someone, you know, being hairier or less hairier, having darker skin, less uh, uh, lighter skin, uh, blue eyes, brown eyes, these kind of uh, things. Uh, uh, angular nose, a uh, 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 big jawline, a you know, just subtle, subtle things about your about your physical appearance that take place in a in a population, just in isolation. This is it. this is not speciation necessarily. These are. Uh, uh, Long-term isolation could lead to speciation, but, people, but species like humans don't have that problem because we're highly migratory, so we in, interact with each other a lot, and we interbreed with uh, other populations a lot. But phenotypic traits still take hold. That's um, the more, and, and as we move into the modern era and humans travel more and more and interact more and more with phenotypes that they normally wouldn't in you know Paleolithic times, sure, uh, there are distinct differences, but these differences aren't the differences that you talk about when you talk about two different species. These are just surface deep, uh, would be the, like you have like leopards with different, uh, different coat patterns. It's not a different subspecies. They have less hair because it's hot, so they don't need that hair to keep them warm, right? So even humans can adapt on a, on a, on a, on a micro level to suit their environments. By the way, I don't, understand how we as Indians, well, Pakistani Indians, because we, we're hairy people when it's hot, so I don't know, we kind of... Right, because it doesn't matter. The, the environment, it, when it comes to these human traits, the environment's not going to come into uh, play as much, because we had uh, started, before we even, uh, you would even call us modern man, we'd already started to remove ourselves from uh, from nature, right? We'd already started to isolate ourselves um, from nature, and live independently from it so the like things like clothing uh would make it so you really wouldn't need to worry about having a coat of fur or not or be that'd be a favorable trait um it's just the like i was saying before the phenotypic traits that took hold in your population uh and, you know if the the mating success of the guy with the hairy chest was better then that got passed on Following that theory, we should have not been hairy as well. But I'm not allowed. I don't, I don't think I have a lot of chest hair. 
that hidden. Keep that hidden, inshallah. There's a little the bit of... I'm trying to make is... It's kind of cute, but... Yeah, I don't think they think it's, that, that it's cute, that the way that they interact with each other. Mm. That we don't necessarily have a problem with saying that humans adapted on a micro level. But to say we adapted on a, or we evolved on a, uh, sorry, on a macro level, but to, sorry, sorry, we have a problem saying that humans adapted on a micro level, but to say they did on a macro level, that's something that clearly goes in opposition to our text, to our Quran. Right, so your Quran's wrong because now we know that me and you and you, both you two gentlemen, are all uh, descendant from mostly Homo sapiens, but we all have that one little dab since we're from out of Africa, uh, above Sub-Saharan Africa, we all have a little dab of Neanderthal in us, just a little, a little sprinkling. So there you go. If you want to see macro evolution in the human species, we know for a fact that we had Neanderthal ancestry. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so but Allah said in the Quran, sorry, in Surah oh, Al-Nur, oh. ayah number, uh, number 45, Allah said, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created everything from water. Every living thing, everything that Allah created, yeah? Uh, sorry, sorry, every creature that Allah created came from water, right? That's interesting because when you look into evolutionary biology, you find that, you know, the first organisms that evolved, the first creatures that came, they were actually creatures that were in the water, right? The so... In your story, you're saying Allah created things from water? I don't know. I didn't know that. I thought that uh, everything was created from the dust of the earth. You have a more detailed creation story that I'm not aware of because I thought it was based on the Pentateuch. Or not the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch's the modern one. What's the, uh, the, the old? No, the Torah is the old one. It's not the Pentateuch, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Is the, the Old Testament part of... The Quran is it based on the Pentateuch? Like, because I know it's an Abrahamic faith, and they have a very specific uh, creation event. They don't remember water being part of it. Atheists came from rocks. Muslims came from water, and Christians came from dust. So we're like the races of Middle Earth, right? The first, um, the first organisms. This is in consistency with the Quran, right? Allah said, Allah created every living thing from water. So pay attention. Every creation that we see, every creature, its origins was water. Was water. So Allah brought it from water, right? So we've got no problem saying that these things. This is true. Yes, all organisms descend from marine organisms. You and me. Yep. A period of time, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created it in such a way where the process. Originally started from water and then they ended up in how they are now. And then Allah actually goes on to say, and then from them, Allah created those who they walk ala batnihi, on their stomachs, like the snakes, right? And then Allah said, there are those who walk on their two legs and then there are those who walk on all fours. To show you that all of these various different types of creatures that walk on the earth, these animals that we see, those who are on their stomachs, those who are on their two legs, those who are on their okay. fours, they all came from what? Hey, jump shop! Originally, they all came from water. And there's many other verses like this. And this was 14. So I'm cool with what they're saying so far. I don't think that, uh, that devising that uh, life originated in the seas um, necessarily proves the God, though. It proves that people, were, it, people in the past have been smart enough to figure that stuff out, too. That, like, hey, um, it seems like arms and legs and, are, and stuff are, uh, are derived fins, right? I mean, we can see that. We can see uh, that their ear bones are modified gills, even if they're, you know, someone who's seen a human skeleton or uh, and then seen a fish skeleton, they can see that. So it's not not improbable that that that, that could have uh, taken hold early on. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong. Hundred fourteen hundred years ago in a desert in a desert, the Prophet sallallahu he you know conveyed this ayah from Allah from Allah, which was telling us well that so. In the desert, you got to think too that the water is life, right? Like the the rarity of water in the environment uh, is a significant significant impact on uh, on the culture and how they how they view water. Water becomes a hot commodity when you live uh, with uh, four thousand miles of sand in every direction. That's an exaggeration, but yeah, hundreds of miles of sand in every direction was not a uh, water uh, hole to be seen. That's why oasis were so uh, renowned, right? So, yeah, water was a hot commodity to the people writing these books.
everything that's been created has come from water. And water. now science has actually proved... And everything seemed to need it, right? All the organisms of the world, from plants to fungus and every animal that, that creeps or crawls, they all need water in some way, shape, or form. But like we're, what, I think we're 70? 70, 70% 70 water, right? 70% water. Right, 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 um, right, absolutely. And not only that, evolutionary biology actually explains that the first living organisms that did evolve, the first organisms were... They did, like they, they Marine, did, they from sure. water, right? So this is something that's very profound. But what we have an issue with is for you to say that the human species, human species has also basically come from this macro evolutionary okay. process. Okay. You see, so now that you accepted that earlier when you were talking about Homo habilis and uh, Neanderthals and all that, you were you were accepting that. That sounds so absurd because I can understand how it's difficult for people who um. Who you know they're they're like you know there's so much scientific evidence and you guys are just gonna turn a blind eye to it. Um, when we're not turning a blind eye to this 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 wealth of scientific evidence, no. What we are turning a blind eye is to the assumption that says that Adam, the first human being, the first Homo sapien, came from this macro process. And the way that we explain that is that that, that was a miracle. A miracle is what a miracle is when a lot. What's a miracle? What part of it's a miracle is? I, I he's gonna explain what a miracle is, but I want to know what part of the uh, of the Genesis creation was a miracle. I mean, uh, well, I know it has to be a miracle, but what part of, since they're accepting that animals change and things like that, that what part of uh, of the phenotypic changes that take place um, in populations being isolated would prevent something that resembles a australopithecine from evolving into a human through the processes that you've already accepted? I don't, I haven't heard anything yet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does something that's outside the productive capacity of the natural world. He basically does exactly what he wants to do, and he doesn't necessarily follow the natural process of the way things are going, right? So it's, it's, an, anom it's an anomaly that Allah brings into place, because okay. يريد, he does whatever he wills. He creates anything that he wills, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, right? So he decided to interrupt that process with his ability and to place the human being in that way. And then, of course, in order to, for us to substantiate that claim, we have to substantiate that the Qur'an is indeed a divine speech and scripture that came from Allah. But that's a discussion for another day. That's a discussion for another day, right? Mm -hmm. Because the Qur'an for us is a means of proof. It's a means of evidence. Yeah, that's a discussion for another day. But if you're going to use that as your, as your reason why science is wrong, you need to unpack it and explain. Okay, and this Quran it came from the creator of the heavens and earth. So now you've got the creation who are the scientists that are doing their best to try and work out the creation. So we don't mind, we'll, t we'll take what you say as long as it goes in consistency with what the creator of the heavens and the earth says. But like I said, to substantiate that claim, which we've got no, I will believe you as long as it doesn't, doesn't conflict with what I already believe. That's what they're saying here, which is not a good way to science at all problem doing but that's a discussion for another day okay so i've got a question right so here the person said now that obviously we've differentiated between evolution in other creatures and evolution in humans yeah. which islam clearly negates but we don't islam doesn't negate necessarily the micro evolution so the, macro from yeah the origin of human exactly species. so human beings can adapt okay so he says why but you so you're the things that you're accepting here about humans adapting which parts of those don't apply to adapting from Australopithecines to modern humans? Which features physically that you, that are changing in the way in any way that, that you have already said that you that, that that you accept? Which features are changing in a way that you don't accept, and why do you not accept those changes, but you accept the phenotypic changes within the group, and the, of course genotypic changes at the at the root level, of course, but for for now, we're gonna just, yeah, we're gonna discuss what's uh, what's visibly expressed. That's why I'm sticking with uh, with phenotype because they are accepting physical changes. Because a lot of the the differences between even uh, uh, erectus in modern man are, are are phenotypical, right? Or the way that the uh, the genes allowing the the body to develop more so than just that it was that it was. Uh, born with different uh different characteristics because if you look at the the neoteny among any of these uh other species of of homo there there are our infants look a lot alike they look pretty much the same right it's when we start to grow up and develop um and especially when we go through puberty and develop into adulthood 
that we start to develop some of these traits that help us differentiate one clade of homo from another. Uh, so he says, he says there is clearly evidence. Yeah. Why does not believe in evolution when there is clearly evidence? So which evidence is mm-hmm. he referring to? Because obviously there's, ev- there's evidence for yeah. micro in animals, macro in animals, micro in humans, macro in... So which evidence is clearly so, okay, there? Okay, good. So, so let's discuss scientific evidence now. Okay. Okay. We live in this day and age where people... So he's going to explain the black swan fallacy and why you can't trust science because of the black swan fallacy. So they, they speak as if science is the means all and the ends all for absolute truth. Okay. And this is absolutely just not the case, right? Science has got so many problems with it and it's got so many limitations. It's good. It has its benefits. If you just hold on. So let's, let's clarify. Science is just, uh, observation prediction observation prediction observation prediction just over and over again it's observing something saying hey i think this is caused by this observing it again seeing if it, was, it seemed like it was caused by that and just keep doing that over and over and over again until you're pretty dang sure that this that that you know x plus uh y equals z that doesn't mean that there can't be a radical in the in the equation and, and we, the evolution not only uh, not only uh, makes room for that it requires those radicals those radicals are the changes know that you know if, if you know the limitations of science then you can be productive with it you keep it in its place and it don't let it overstep its boundaries right for example it's funny because looking for the radicals is actually how we define evolution right it's how we how we uh, identify that there's been a change in a population is via this the, via the process that he's about to outline right here via the the We found the black swan. Science cannot tell you anything about morality, right? Science cannot tell you anything about morality. Speaking of morality, did Mark Reed tuck tail and run before we could discuss the morality uh, debate that we got planned on on Debate Me Bra with Amy Newman, me versus the one and only master debater, Mark Reed. Do other species of organisms have morality? We are going to make it happen. You should be there too. If you're not subscribed to Amy Newman, definitely subscribe. Someone needs to drop Amy's link in the in the live chat. This is going to happen. Right? And morality is a clear-cut refutation on this notion that the human species evolved. And I give you my Can you give I, an example. I give you my example. We as human beings are the only moral creatures, right? We are the only moral species on the planet. Okay? We know right from wrong. We know. Yeah, Mark. And these these Muslim guys think that we're the only moral species on the planet. I disagree. This is evil. No matter what culture you go into, no matter what place you go into, no matter what time you go on, there are universal moral principles that everyone knows that it's wrong. Okay, no matter what day and time and age you live in, we know that murder is wrong. We even know that lying is wrong. You know, when a child lies for the very first time, scientists, they did research and they found that, you know, there are certain changes that take place in a child's body. For example, his heartbeat starts to to race, his palms get sweaty, his voice starts to croak. And when they were asked why, they would say, all we can say is that the human being wasn't created to lie or it wasn't supposed to lie. They won't say created, but they say, human being wasn't supposed to lie. Yeah, lying is a learned behavior, but humans aren't the only ones that do it. Monkeys do it too. Like the monkeys that lie and the monkeys will punish the monkeys that lie too. If you get caught lying and you're a monkey, like if you like everybody's eating and you can't get to the food. So you start screaming that there's an eagle. So everybody goes and hides so you can go get some food. The rest of the monkeys will mob you and kick your butt. Made to lie. Was it manufactured to lie? So where did this moral compass come from that shows you that lying is wrong? Where did it- Some people don't seem to have that issue with lying. Um, it really becomes more of a... Uh, uh, learned behavior, um, how you learn what the way that you learn that lying works and how it affects the outcomes that'll affect how your body responds to the notion of lying. Where does moral compass come from that shows you it's wrong for a person Mom's to murder spaghetti. another human being, to rape another human being? Where did that come from? Because when you, you usually, what, oh, good, good, let's do this. Okay, so the morality is not objective or subjective. Um, it's relevant and it's like an onion. Morality is like an onion. 
It's layered. You know what else has layers? Parfaits. So we're going to say morality is like a parfait with an onion inside of it. Okay, so your uh, morality initially, you know, there's going to be some biological drivers there. We are a, a social species. So you're born already with certain hardwired social characteristics to help you thrive within the social species. The reason that is, is the same reason why there are no short neck drafts. Those ones didn't pass on their genes. The ones, the species of humans, uh, or the, not the species, the, uh, the, the individuals, actually, I said not to avoid individuals, but the individuals that arise in a population that are antisocial or parasocial, they tend to to not pass on their genetics. So whatever anomalies have arisen among the, those individuals don't generally take hold in the population. Only the, the hyper-social natural drivers for, that we generally have. The things that make you have your emotions. The things that you call your morals uh, at the surface level. But you're from the point of birth, your morals are sculpted literally from the moment you are able to see the face of your mother. You develop a distinct... Uh, uh, bias towards individuals that look like your mother. So people with facial features or complexions that deviate from that are already, from the moment you open your eyes, appearing to be alien to you, appearing to be uh, foreign to your uh, to your experience. So you're already standoffish against those people, right? So uh, you already develop a uh, a out group. Right. If if before you even uh, before you even can think, you've already developed an out group. Uh, the less something or someone looks like your mother, right? So you have more compassion towards anything and everything that looks closer to that than anything that looks alien or different from that. So, uh, but you can if you're born into a multicultural society though, and you're exposed to a lot of different people from the moment you open your eyes, then that that is negated and doesn't take hold quite as much. It's uh, funny that. So from there on out, you are your morality is sculpted by the people in your life. Your morality is going to be built by the society that you live in. By uh, and there's going to be a, there's going to be a certain level of standards of behavior that you learn early on from being a member of that society. From being a member of you could be also be a member of a uh, family group, and then you and then you're also going to be the member of a close knit you know. Uh, either parental child and siblings or uh, or just parental and child, depending on if you're an only child of that group as well. So you're going to have standards of behavior and practice that are imprinted upon you from a very young age of all of those groups. And then, uh, I mean, we can extend it beyond it just as, as a living organism, right? But and you're, it's going to come down right down to your individual experiences as well that sculpt your uh your morality. So it's layered like that. It comes from your species, from being a social species, to being a member of a social species society, to being a member of a specific group within that society, to be a member of a specific clan within that society, to being uh, uh, within a specific family group and so forth. All of those things are going to factor and layer down onto what builds your morality and who you are from an evolutionary uh, perspective. What would they say? They would say evolution. Oh. No, the, uh, well, if you say society, well, then you have a problem because Hitler managed to convince all or the majority. Who had Godwin? Check your cards. Anybody have Godwin? Uh, yeah, this is the, the and this is the layer that I was talking about with, with societal. Unfortunately, yeah, it is a bad side effect of uh, of societal uh, evolutionary influence that we can be conditioned to other. Um, people groups out of uh, out of fitting into our category of compassion and uh, our, mo our moral compassion for that group of germans at his time that the murder of the not of the jews was something that was morally correct true but now, even though he yeah exactly you can you can use that natural thing that i was talking about with your your mom when you imprinted when you were a, a baby you can use that you can weaponize that absolutely and if you can weaponize the cult at a cultural level, that's when it becomes uh, a just a horrible uh, a sp downward spiral of, uh, of genocide or war. I mean, 
it always it, it always has throughout history that's what war is that's how we we do war to kill the other people you have to other them and be uh and, and you have to put it within your moral code that you are supposed to be exterminating this other group it's learned behavior manipulated his society and managed to do that we will still stand here and say that was immoral but if you say no, society actually allows for a person's morality to be shaped, then that means you have to say, and I'm not saying this, but I'm saying this is what would be, this, would, this is what would necessitate. Your morality, state. yes, your morality can be shaped. Uh, definitively, it can. That's not up for debate. <laughs> from your speech is that at the time when Hitler managed to convince the people that murdering of the Jews is something that is a moral thing and we need to do that to fulfill the, the, the objectives of the Aryan race, you would have to say that at that time, those German Nazi soldiers that were carrying out those executions and oppression, they were morally right. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it was immoral. But if you take that stance that society governed it... That's not to say that they were morally right. That's not true at all. It, the outcome, the results of their actions are demonstrably morally wrong uh, to us as a species to wipe out a population. It's the same reason uh, that we don't want to wipe out any population of anything. That's why we have uh, campaigns to save the fucking whales, dude. We don't want to... We, we understand as a... As, as, as a group, as a global society, that it's wrong to wipe out an entire uh, entire ethnic group. We know that. We 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 know that as a as a global society. So no, it's not. We're not okay with that. And things like this happen now. Things like this happen uh, all over the world. There's not just the Jews. The Armenian genocide, for instance, or the. Uh, what, what's the massacre in China? The Japanese, uh, the big, big massacre. Ah, the massacre of, I get it mixed up in my head. But yeah, drop somebody, if you remember what I'm talking about, drop it in there where they killed thousands of, of Chinese people because of this othering mentality that, that we are very susceptible to as a species. And you'd have to say that that was morally correct. And that's a problem, right? And no one's gonna... It is a problem, yeah. It is a problem. Societal uh, drivers of morality can be a big problem. They can Absolutely. Agree to that. So society didn't do it. Another argument that people will come Right. From. Society doesn't have perfect morality. And the Nanking, thank you, Tsunami. You are the rock star. The rape of Nanking, exactly. Disgusting. Because of othering. Because of the behavior that they're describing here. That, that, that can't be true because they don't like the implications of it. It's something called consequentialism. They will say, we as a species, we looked at the consequences of our actions. Mm -hmm. We saw that murder had bad consequences. People got mm -hmm. angry, upset, people took revenge, blah, blah, right. blah. So over time, we realized murder is wrong. We saw the same with, with, with lying. We saw that lying had negative consequences, etc., so on and so forth. So they said every time an action happened, over years, we would look at the benefits, and if it had benefits, mm -hmm. it would become morally correct. And if it had negative, then it would become... It but only since we've had culture, though. Got to keep that in mind that we have the culture to pass down this, this wisdom. Become morally evil. And then what we would say in response to them is that there are clear-cut immoral actions that you can do that have no negative consequences. That have no negative consequences. Yet you still believe that they're immoral. Is this where your controversial video from three years ago came right. into play? Right, exactly. So oh, like, this is... if, I, if, if you give a person seminal fluid to drink, like if, if you give a guy... People don't get it. They don't understand. But I'm still understanding from this. If you give a guy a cup of seminal fluid and you say this is your dad's sperm, right? <laughs> your dad. He, 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 he. It came in this cup. Drink it. You're not going to drink it. Why? What's wrong? What's the difference between a daughter drinking her dad's seminal fluid or, you know, stuff like this is haram. It's not permissible for us to do even to our husbands and our spouses. But she will have no problem drinking the seminal fluid of her boyfriend or whatever else other guy that she happened to be with. But she'll do it with her. Why won't she do it with her father? Because immorally she knows there's something wrong here, right? Another example is that if you take a... A child who's like six months old and you have a, an adult a filthy human being who masturbates over this child is that immoral 
course. But is there any negative consequence that can come from that? Is there any the child won't remember nothing. So I want to take a moment to say, I don't know these gentlemen. I don't know anything about their religion or culture or anything that they're following specifically. So I don't want to broad brush. I don't want to broad brush anybody into a group. But while we watch this next segment here, I want you guys to take time and reflect on this being the, the, uh, the culture or a uh, relevant culture, I should say, that gave us, uh, that gave us Justin Downing. I just want you to take a moment to do that. It's, it's sad that people actually use that as an argument to try and, you know, say that pedophilia should be allowed and this and that. It, well, exactly. That's, that, that's what I'm saying. When, when, when you adopt these, 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 this is barbaric. When you adopt these barbaric, you know, uh, philosophies, it, it, it facilitates for, for, for stuff like this to happen and it opens doors for things like this, right? And they claim that there can't, that there's no trauma by this, by this uh, action. That, there, that there's not any trauma for a child being exposed to this. There's no... There's no, they're, 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 they're like, oh, there's no proof it's going to, it's going to impact or hurt the child, but good God. <sighs> so th that child has no recollection of it. That child has absolutely no recollection. It cannot be psychologically damaged or scarred or whatever have you. So God see, I, did, I don't know if they consider themselves Republicans, they're conservatives is the, is the, the. The meat and the potatoes of it. These are conservative gentlemen. But there's no negative consequence. In fact, the guy enjoyed himself. So for him, it's a, it's a, it's a positive. Do you see your it? claim is that there's no negative consequences. That's your claim. I'd say that there is negative consequences. As long as that child is aware, there's negative consequences. Whether they can remember exactly why they have this aversion to a certain behavior is irrelevant to whether it impacted their psychological development. Yeah. So, 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 consequentialism doesn't provide an answer, and then the answer that you usually run to is evolution. But we say, hold up, have you not seen the jungle? The jungle has, uh, the, the, you know, when adaptation occurs, according to you, it doesn't occur on the basis of moral value. It occurs on the basis of survival value. Mm -hmm. Survival value necessity. Well, moral value within your pop within your population, right? The, the values of a lion are different than the moral values of a, of a human are different than the moral values of a mouse. A quokka will throw its baby at you to escape predators because biologically it is, uh, it is more beneficial for the species as a whole to sacrifice an undeveloped or uh, underdeveloped organisms that can't survive on its own than for her to sacrifice herself and the baby. So it dumps the baby out to the predator to eat. It's not a good thing, but it's just their defense measure, right? But social species exhibit certain levels of what we call in humans altruism, where you sacrifice, are willing to sacrifice yourself for the population. So that's that's just a, a, a outgrowth of being a social species, right? It's that you're going to have to do some pretty, what we would consider evil things in the animal kingdom. The Hanuman Lauga monkey from America, from, from India, the what? Hanuman Lauga monkey. It's the name of a, of a species of monkey in, in India. When it takes a over, when, 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 it, when it takes over a tribe of monkeys, it kills the leader. Not only that, what it does is that it actually kills all of the children of that leader. Because that one leader would sleep with all and had in, um, basically, you know, mate. sleep with them. Now they just they mate with them. But yeah, there's monkeys. There's uh, monkeys that, that kill the infants of their rivals. Absolutely. There's humans that do too. As a matter of fact, I read this book where. Uh, these people were told to go in and kill all the babies of uh, of a rival. When they so in this book I read, they defeated the um, the the uh, the leader of the monkey of the 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 evil primates, and they actually had a, a god come in and tell them to kill all the babies of the of the rival uh, of the rival primate. What was the name of that book? It starts with a starts with a B. 
Maybe it's just for kill. <laughs> <laughs> with all of the other females so he would yeah. have many children so he would not only kill the, the leader of the tribe but he would kill all the other baby monkeys as well he would murder them right so they don't over, one day overtake him that we would consider see using, and you're using language there murder is also another word for uh, yeah interspecific uh, killing is, is called murder in humans we generally don't use that word for animals but uh, that's it's, it's, it's the same concept we just have a special word for it when it applies to humans interspecific uh uh, killing is is what we call murder in humans. Moral. So if evolution is where we're getting our moral compass from, then, you know, why the hell do are we are our morals in direct opposition to evolution. what happens in evolution? Right. The great white shark it forcefully copulates when it mates. In other words, it rapes. But we consider rape to be. To Lots of species have aggressive reproductive strategies. Um, a lot of species do. Uh, a lot other some primates do. Uh, orangutans are are pretty aggressive uh, sex partners. For instance, the males are, and they're quite a bit bigger than the female. Otters are rape crazy. Otters, um, th th it's their copulation process. It's how they reproduce. Other species, there's uh have natural behaviors that they do, like the rhino beetles. Uh, the female. Uh, is exposed to uh, to the males uh, fighting with each other, and it triggers hormonal releases to make her ready to copulate. So the males have to fight. Uh, their toucans do something similar, where they do uh, fencing with their beaks is a uh, behavioral thing. It's uh, so violence is part of uh, a lot of animals' uh, reproductive strategies, whether that's violence between males rivaling or violence towards the uh, the mating partner, and. Uh, it swings both ways too. If you look at spiders, the the female will eat the male if he can't get away. And praying mantises, she will eat him while they're in the process of copulating. So, uh, yeah, to be an immoral thing. Do you see? So, if we took our morals from evolution, then our morals would not be. There would be no morality. Our moral, our, our, rather, our morality would be in line with survival of the fittest. You see what I'm saying? And it's not like that. It's not like that. And I've got a video in a bit more detail. It's called, um, I think it's called Atheist, Will You Drink Your Dad's Sperm? Or something like that. I know it's a bit of a controversial name, but I'll put the, the video. That's so, such a bizarre notion. Drink your dad's sperm. So I don't think, he mentioned, oh, your girlfriend or some guy you hook up with. He's just like, he, he doesn't, uh, doesn't do it in a glass and say, I don't drink it. It's not how, it's not how that works in sexy time. Detail. The point I'm trying to make is that evolution doesn't. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that evolution doesn't answer this fundamental question of morality. of morality. So, so how can you give me this clear cut evidence? But the Quran answers this question for you. The Quran tells you that you have a creator, a Lord who created you, and He instilled these morals and these values inside of you. Just skip through the verses, and then you'll see the hadith of the Prophet Ali The Quran tells us that we were born upon what you call the fitra, which is the innate natural disposition. This, 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 this is the perfect. innate this is natural the disposition, creation, right? A lot of us that you have an innate knowledge, an innate understanding of morality. That a lot That's the biological drivers as opposed to social species that I was talking about there. Those, those are, are ingrained at birth. Um, you naturally imprint upon, again, your mother and your social group. So, yeah, it's, 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 that's your natural morality um, through uh, both epigenetic uh pieces and uh, learned social behavior in infancy as instilled in us the moment we were born from this innate morality is what the belief that there is a creator right okay and and that and 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 the, and the prophet muhammad sallam, has backed up in his in, in his hadith and in fact there's actually a study that was done in the university of cambridge by a professor called justin O'Barrett, but it proved so, so far so i know i know i know i know i know but uh, it's there, was a, time. There, was a, there was a study that was done in the University of Cambridge by a professor called Justin L. Barrett, yeah? And his study is actually very profound. If you go, just Google it and, uh, you know, Google it so you can find out what the name of his books are and you can purchase them. But he actually concluded that, um, uh, you know, if he was to take children um, from... Why is it... The, the, I'm getting, getting really uh, quite disturbed about all, all these analogies. They're just about... Uh, Abusing children from, from from young and place them on an island where they would have to fend for themselves and there was no external kind of influence on them. They would automatically grow up believing in a in a in a superior creator that sees them, that watches them, that hears them. 
And that's not, I don't think that's true, though. I'm, well, maybe they may have supernat- ideas about supernatural things, right? Because it'd be like, like we were in our early days where the wind was controlled by this god and the sun was that god and the, the ocean was that god. We didn't know what was causing these things to happen. So we know that when we, you know, do this, when we blow, it makes wind. So maybe there's something really big out there making wind, things like that. Uh, they, they, they did extensive study and research towards they came to, by means of which they came to this conclusion and you can just go and check it out online but I don't need to go to that scientific research because my lord Allah once I've already established that the Quran is true and I've and I've established that the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is dead. but you haven't established that it's true you haven't given us anything to indicate that the Quran is true you're just like ah uh, science means these consequences which consequentialism is not a factor here consequentialism doesn't have any any Wait on truth it is the messenger of Allah who was sent with this with this with this divine knowledge that was given to him then I don't need to go to seven t- scientific evidence because I'm getting it directly from the source do you see that we have something called the fitter the innate natural disposition another thing that that that, that uh, evolution doesn't answer is how the first cell actually came into being the first cell the first cell the first organism that split that evolved because there had to be a living organism they're talking about a biogenesis right here very conf- they're very confused about what it is though that began to evolve do you see where did that living organism evolve from? They say it came from nothing. Uh, well, no, that's no, no, no hold up. They say that they, they argue the universe came from nothing, some of them. But okay, the universe came from nothing, <laughs> but within the universe. No, the, 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 saying the universe from nothing was a tongue in cheek thing, uh, not like a real argument. That says these living organisms, the first cell that happened to come oh, in this universe. Where did. Oh, that came from nothing too? Mm. Do you know how absurd that is? That's what, mm. like, that's worse than me saying, hey. I have a, a hat and I'm going to pull a rabbit out of it. Because at least the person who believed that the rabbit came out of the hat, there was a hat for the rabbit to come All out right. of. I'm but at least people believe that the rabbit bit. came out of it. We're Did pushing see? towards And there's noon. so many other things like Wallah, for example. Um, String, they affirm anomalies for nature, but not for Allah. Not, not for Allah, exactly. And I'm saying this is, this is, this is, this is like Islam. Anomalies are what we look for to find, uh, when we're talking about genetics, to find medical uh, issues. We, we, we do utilize, uh, utilize, genetics for a lot of this stuff <laughs> it's it's weird that you have a problem with that in my opinion okay. not that i'm saying this is the proof okay not that i'm doing the same this is the proof because we have we have objective evidence to establish that the quran is indeed a divine word of allah okay and that's a video hopefully for another day if someone sends in if they send in enough questions, you don't have that video. though i, I but i'm this saying should you be don't an evidence, even though this is not our primary evidence the fact that the quran is in exact consistency and harmony with the rest of creation and it fills in the gaps of science right this is not called God of the Gaps. People will say, oh, you just want to place God wherever you can't answer a question. No, rather, we flip it. We say this is science of the gaps. That you've come to a limitation of science. Science, science of the gaps. Know, science, is a, science of the gaps is just what they call uh, the black swan fallacy. Um, which is, it is, the black swan fallacy is a fallacy. But it's not, it, it, it's um, within uh, scientific theory there's what we call the hume's problem of induction right that's that's um that's the root of the black swan fallacy and that's what they're going to dive into here and it is a valid it is a valid point of about the scientific endeavor though but we have to operate within the confines of the scientific process until and those anomalies are what we're looking for we are actually we do accept the black swan when it swims by but there's no sense in, in, in uh, making a case for the black swan until you see it. Um, we, until you see the black swan, we're operating in, in a universe where the swans are white. And that's okay. It's okay to be wrong about that when the black swan appears. Sci- how, how, how does the scientific method work? It is a means of observation, right? And from that observation, you extract a hypothesis. Which means that anything that you cannot look at, you cannot... See. You can extrapolate something from it, right? So if you can't observe, you can't extrapolate a hypothesis. So morality, can you see it? No. no, morality is not something that you can see. So science or evidence... No, you can't see morality because morality is uh, in, uh, informed by actions, right? Uh, and you can do psychological testing on a person to kind of find out where their morality is, where it stems from and things like that. You, there, there's ways to, to scientifically measure an individual's uh, morality. You'll never be able to answer the question, why do I believe murder is wrong? Why do I believe that it's wrong for a person to rape? Why do I, why do I believe it's wrong for a person to masturbate over a six-month-year-old baby? This is something that they would Jesus, why do you... Right? you, so you to, murder is fine. Just, just stick with murder. You don't need to add in babies and stuff. 
to go beyond the scope of science. I mean, if you want to talk about babies, you can talk about killing babies or something like that. Don't you? You gotta, you gotta stop with this. Um, the this is to all the Dawa people. Please stop with the uh, uh, the the children and the adult activity stuff. It's not a it, we we get it. We can make the same cases using examples like murder. There's no sense in you all to keep focusing on this type of topic. Have a good one, uh, Dave. Thank you for stopping by. Um, but yeah, you, we get it. But you, there's currently, you know, you're talking about scientific evidence and correlation. There's a correlation between this Dawa uh, community and uh, uh, questionable activity and questionable ideas about children. So I think it'd be a good idea and be beneficial for you guys to just stop uh, taking it in that direction. You see where I'm coming from. So for a person to say, no, science will answer this question. That's science of the gaps. Uh, That's not God of the gaps. I'll have to be. Do you see? Yeah. Rather, we have a very fun... We, we have, no, we, so again, it's the black, it's the, the black swan, right? Uh, you say, if we... It, it, well, we've never seen a black swan before and we discover a new continent and we expect that if there are swans on that continent that they're going to be white, right? That's the expectation of, of science, of the scientific method. This is just an example. And then we get to that new continent and find that there are swans, but there are black ones, then that is the, that that is where we were incorrect and we correct our, our observations. But it, up until the point that we had observed those black swans, uh, it is perfectly scientifically reasonable to say um, that swans are black. Now, or sorry, black swans are white. And now um we've discovered this new population it, we can change that to say swans are typically black or something along those lines but we're, we're, we're saying hold up hold up hold up i mean the discussion can go on the discussion can go on but that's now we're going into another topic like, there's so many other ways we can explain the weaknesses and of, of 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 evolution right without even criticizing the scientific evidence i'm not even i'm not even going into that that's a discussion for another day i'd actually like to forward people to a a, a, a brother called Sabur ahmed yeah who's got some really good material online on the issue of evolution and hopefully i'll put some links below and uh, he, he even tackles it from a scientific perspective, right? But I'm just discussing it from the angle of, hold up, like, science is not the only way, right? There's so many other elements and factors that come into place, and the Qur'an is the only thing that answers those questions for you, right? So we have a very, very, um, uh, very sound basis to reject the evolution of, of the macro-evolution of, of the Homo sapien. Oh, right. okay, I think that was... To release a very, very insightful educational yeah. video. I'm I don't really feel like we did it. We did the topic justice because uh, it's such a big topic, and you know, Hold I up. didn't actually. No, you much didn't on it, do the but, topic uh, justice. I think I, think I did. I filled in your gaps. By no though. means is this the um, the most conclusive answer on the issue. Yeah, but we have ten more minutes left. Yeah, I think I think at least to start a a nice, healthy, you know, healthy discussion. So you can either email them to us. Yeah. At session at gmail.com. Yeah. They, they or they can All right. So that's what I'm just gonna stop there. I think they just ramble here with each other for the next ten minutes. So that was. Nasia Sessions, a uh, Islamic channel that is uh, uh, doing, it's a Dala channel that's doing apologetics. They have, again, they had tw uh, 292,000 subscribers on this channel, and that's, they have 2K videos, and that's the kind of content they're putting out. Um, so, if you'd like to see more content and more responses to videos like this or more uh, uh, more direct, directed uh, responses towards uh, Islamic sects, that's, uh, and I said sects with a T, um, let me know and we can we can schedule those in. I've been trying to branch out and, uh, and, and not just focus uh, on, on Baptists, uh, Baptist and evangelicals and young earth creationists who are largely and almost uh, exclusively in that group. But there are other groups that have these ideas too. So hopefully this, uh, this is a fun uh, breakdown. I had a lot of fun just this last hour or so just follow, just responding to these guys. It was great. Uh, I, they, the, the things that they're saying are so uninformed. It's uh, ridiculous. All right. So that we have one last segment for the day. So um, stick around for my live from the Hive audience. Uh, to the Creation Watch uh, crowd, hello and thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, we will be back with you Friday with some cryptic corner. Should be a fun romp through the halls of the unknown. And then obviously 
Saturday morning. Be here live from the hive. We'll have a good time. We'll look at some wild ideas. We will try to debunk some questionable claims. And we're just going to have an overall good time. Uh, so tune in for us live from the hive Saturday. Uh, please remember to be kind and take care.